Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Promoting Responsible Leadership session of the annual meeting of the New Champions 2019. A very warm welcome to all of you. I hope you enjoy the video just now. Uh, introducing myself, my name is Nancy Ju, anchor woman of Phoenix TV. I'm your MC and moderator for today's session. She's repeating herself, just uh, what, what she just said. Now, thank you for spending your precious lunch hour with us. This is going to be a 75-minute session, which promises to be informative, engaging, and fun. And I hope you will stay with us for the entire session. So leaders today have a choice between leaving a legacy that tackles climate crisis as well as the unprecedented levels of inequality, or one that risks ecological and societal damage. So how can leaders today pave the way for the next generation's success? The grand challenges such as global warming, rising inequality and poverty not only put pressure on governments and international organizations, but also on businesses to contribute to a sustainable future. So ladies and gentlemen, what is responsible leadership? Why is it important to us in today's society? And why do young people increasingly feel that their future is under threat? And what are the businesses, business and policy innovations that can help to address these challenges? And how can private sector leaders rethink their business models to help with these problems? We'll hopefully come to some solutions during today's session. Again, she's repeating herself what she had just said. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to now introduce our first two speakers. And they are Mr. Henry Mott Mignos and Adriana De Palma. And they'll be coming on stage to give you a global situation space presentation. And they'll be guiding you through graphs and data to show you what is actually happening in terms of inequality issues, in terms of climate change issues. Introducing, first of all, Henry. Um, Henry started a company called Education in 2015, which is the largest youth tech platforms in the Philippines, empowering 10 million students in a year to make better decisions for their education as well as career. And introducing Adriana. Adriana is a co-investigator and biodiversity researcher at the Natural History Museum of the UK. And just note, when they will be showing you the videos, you can pay attention to what appears on the bottom left screen. I think it's bottom left. Um, there will be captions to show you um, the time at which the graphs and the data were collected. That gives you an idea of um, the timeline. So let's give a big round of applause to Henry and Adriana. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. The world has never been richer. As you can see on these graphs, incomes have been rising across the world. And the proportion of those living under $1.90 a day has been going down by the hundreds of millions over the last few decades. If you zoom into Asia, you will see that actually China was a leading cause of such a positive development, responsible for 70% of poverty reduction in the last few decades, with great strides also done in India and in ASEAN. Sharing more good news, incomes globally have been increasing. And this has led to reduced inequality between countries and a situation whereby um, next year, half of the world's middle class will be residing in Asia. But behind such positive headlines, the data tells us another story. And that is a negative one, which is that unfortunately, income inequality within countries has actually been increasing. As you look at the dots formed, you will see that economic growth has been unequal across countries. As market forces have been embraced, a cohesive economic uh, national policy has tended to be left on the side. And as a result, some regions, some cities, or even certain social, socioeconomic segments within cities have been racing ahead of others. 
zooming into Asia, which has obviously been a, a center of economic growth for the world, it's unfortunately the same story. Um, it is not all parts of India or China or ASEAN that are doing just as well as each other. And what we also have to remember is that economic inequality is not just bad in itself. It can actually often cause social unrest, which could potentially undo decades of economic progress. If we believe that we can stay with a business as usual mentality, income inequality will rise in Asia and in other parts of the world. And this can lead to about, I think by 2050, 1% of the world's population controlling 20% of the wealth. So let's take a bit of a, a dive into the causes of such economic inequality. If you look at literacy rates globally, and literacy matters, it's a good proxy for education, it's a good proxy for participation in a knowledge economy. These have actually been improving um, across the world, across different continents. The good news is uh, a lot of the hard work's been done. The bad news is for those that are still left behind, the price of being illiterate just goes up as the average literacy rate increases globally. And what is true globally is true within countries as well. If you move on to then looking at electricity coverage, um, another great factor in people's ability to participate in the modern economy, whether it's for access to education, access to healthcare, access to job opportunities. Electricity coverage has been increasing over time. Um, unfortunately, there are some areas that are quite literally left in the dark. And again, the price to pay for those that are left behind just increases as the rest of the world powers on. But broadly speaking, literacy rates, electricity coverage have actually been doing quite well. And so as a result, new divides are emerging, the internet being a very poignant one. Looking at the map, you can actually see where devices are connecting all over the world. Um, in a way, the internet is absolutely transformative. It allows individuals to gain access to information, to innovation, to improve their productivity. It helps economies leapfrog. But unfortunately, the internet tends to follow um, economic development. And so as a result, it will tend to reinforce existing inequalities, creating a class of have and have nots. If you zoom into Asia, where the uh, internet has been probably some of the, one of the most transformative elements in the last decade or two, there's actually different phenomena at play as well. As young people, or actually the general population in countries like Thailand or the Philippines spend close to 10 hours a day online, they are not just aware of income inequality between their country and more developed ones. They're becoming much more aware of income inequality within their own country. And this is a fact that all stakeholders in society will have to deal with. Now, all of these access issues can feed into youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is a very dangerous uh, development. If we believe that youth are our future, if we believe that they are the bedrock of a fair and cohesive society, then we need to make sure that we're building economies and societies that are creating equal opportunities for all. Unfortunately, the data tells us that we're not doing this right now. If you take a look at Europe in 2008, during the financial crisis, the data will show you that youth unemployment rose quite fast. And the reason is very simple. During economic recessions, the youth are the last to be hired and the first to be fired. This can feed into further income inequalities. And the problem with uh, income inequality and what the youth are facing today is that they feel, they say, that they have it worse off than any other generation. But that is not a feeling, that is a fact rooted in data. And if we do not address this issue, we will be facing a world of rising inequality and increasing social unrest. Now, all these inequalities can feed into stifling growth, can lead into um, falling back economically. But the youth are not just worried about their economic future. The planet we inhabit is on the brink of ecological collapse. And so what is at stake is not just the global economy, but the very survival of humanity. So on that note, let's take a look at some of the impacts that we've had on the natural world so far. The global population has more than doubled since 1970. This, of course, means we need more space to live. So here you can see how urban areas have expanded in recent years. It's doubled since 1992, and now 60% of people live in cities. With this has come the expansion of road networks. Here you can see existing roads showing up in purple. 
And as expansive as these networks appear now, they're continuing to grow. 25 million kilometers of new paved roads are expected to be built by 2050. Now, of course, this can be incredibly important for linking communities and services, but they can also fragment our natural landscapes. But it's not just that the human population has increased. On average now, each person uses twice as much natural resource as a person consumed in 1970. But of course, that global average masks huge inequalities with 11% of the world's people undernourished. So with this rise in human population and increase in consumption of resources, the demand for agricultural products has also increased. Now, although agricultural land has expanded only slowly in recent decades, by about 3% between 1992 and 2015, about half of the expansion of agricultural land has come at the expense of tropical forests. Between 2010 and 2015, 32 million hectares of primary and secondary tropical forest were lost. These maps show how forests are being lost through time. And you can see the losses in red and the gains in blue. And if we zoom in onto the Amazon, you can see how significant these losses are. And they're happening in just the space of 17 years on these maps. Now, as well as agriculture expanding, it's also become much more intensive in terms of the way that it's managed. So here you can see soybean exports from Brazil. Management's become more intensive and we've had huge shifts in production towards cash crops, often in response to demand from overseas. Without global level cooperation to protect our natural world, we risk countries essentially exporting their biodiversity damage by importing products that might not be so environmentally sustainable. Now, all of these land use changes can have significant impact on biodiversity, the diversity of life on Earth. This map shows how vertebrate populations have changed over time. The larger the dot, the greater the change. And you can see both losses in red and gains in green. And there's been huge variation in how species have changed over time, with some having positive responses and some negative. But on average, the picture is actually very bleak with average abundance of vertebrates declining by 60% since 1970. Now, this is just one measure of biodiversity looking at a particular group of species, but there are a number of other metrics showing declines in biodiversity through time. And land use change isn't the only pressure affecting biodiversity, although habitat loss and degradation is one of the key pressures facing today. Pollution, exploitation, and invasive species are all threats as well as, of course, climate change. Now, just one aspect of the climate crisis is the increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. So here you can see how temperature anomalies are becoming more frequent through time, uh, with blue and red indicating areas where you've got spikes in cold and hot temperatures, respectively. Now, changes in the climate like this don't just affect biodiversity. They have significant consequences for human health. India's most intense and longest heat wave in decades has already claimed at least 36 lives, with temperatures reaching 50 degrees Celsius since it began in May. Our marine ecosystems are also particularly vulnerable to climate change. Here you can see how the likelihood of coral bleaching varies through space and time, with the very far end of the spectrum, the very darkest red, showing areas where not just coral bleaching is likely, but coral mortality. Now, a 1.5 degree Celsius average warming in global temperatures could reduce corals by about 80%, but a two degree rise in average global temperatures could reduce them by 99% of their cover. Now, this clearly could have huge consequences for our marine ecosystems, but ultimately for our own food security as well. The climate crisis also has the potential to dramatically change our landscapes. Here you can see the projected sea level rises as a result of 
increases in the average global temperature of between zero and, and four degrees Celsius. If we look to Tianjin, home to about 11 million people, you can see vast swathes of the nearby coastline being submerged if we don't take drastic action to reduce our emissions. Now, we've clearly left our mark on the planet. We need now to undo some of the damage that we've done and find sustainable ways forward. We have to balance a number of goals, including climate change mitigation, biodiversity protection, and ensuring global food security. It's our responsibility to improve the way that we treat our planet, not just for the good of all the creatures we share it with, but also for our own good and for the good of those who come after us. Thank you. Adults keep saying that we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. a strong message. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. For those of you that don't know, um, this was a video call for action uh, by this girl called Greta Thunberg at the um, Winter Davos of 2019. And I wanted to um, give another quote from her video, which is actually longer. She said, at places like Davos, people like to tell success stories. But Sometimes their financial success have come with unthinkable price tag. On climate change, we have to acknowledge that we have failed. All political movements in their present have done so, and the media have failed to gather broad public awareness. So to what degree is that statement true? I'm now going to invite our three panelists to come on stage for a solution-oriented discussion on responsible leadership. Introducing our first panelist, Mr. Fleming Basenbacher, chairman of the supervisory board, Carlsberg Group. Fleming is the chairman of the supervisory board since 2012, um, and he has extensive experience of managing large knowledge-based organizations. He has strong competences relating to innovation, research, and corporate social responsibility. Welcome. Our next panelist is the youngest participant of this year's annual meeting of the New Champions 2019. Anyone has a guess how old she is? She is the youngest participant of this year's meeting. Right, okay. Well, did I already say that in the introduction? Okay, all right, I thought I gave that away. Um, let's welcome Isabel Weissen, our youngest participant. Isabel started Bye Bye Plastic Bags at the age of 10. Um, she was inspired by a lesson at school. Uh, you can tell that story a bit later on. We want to hear why you uh, started um, Bye Bye Plastic Bags when you were 10. And it's a company that you and your sister, uh, well, not a company, an NGO, you and your sister founded. So we are very happy to have Isabel with us today. Our final panelist, Ms. Hao Jingfang, um, who is a Chinese science fiction writer. She won the Hugo Award for the best novelette for Folding Beijing at the 2016 Hugo Awards. Welcome, Ms. Kao. So on the um, forum agenda today, we're going to talk about promoting environmental justice. We're going to talk about bridging social and economic progress, as well as creating an innovation ecosystem. I want to quote again from Greta. Now, she said, youth around the world are mobilizing to express their concern for their future. And many young people now feel they're worse off than the earlier generations. Um, how do you feel about that, Isabel? Um, I think I can speak on that a little bit as the voice of youth on the panel today. Um, and I think that's 
simply because more and more deadlines are coming out, governments are releasing these dates, studies are showing more and more how you know, climate change is affecting our world. But not only that, we are seeing more and more in today's societal climate as well, inequalities in humanitarian issues, animal rights, you know, animals are going extinct every day, and we are losing so much that this world has to offer. And so I think all of us grew up with this sense of urgency. The fact that we don't have the luxury of time anymore, right? We can't wait until we're older to make that difference. And I think that's why sometimes, you know, when we watch these documentaries about, you know, climate change and the way the world is going, it's really overwhelming and can sometimes leave you a bit, you know, sort of, doomed. you feel like we're doomed. Like there's no way out. Mm -hmm. um, I want to share with you some figures. Um, we're experiencing an incredibly conscious, ethics conscious generation. The millennials regard ethics and values higher than a general salary, which is, which is very interesting. According to research carried out by Global Tolerance, 62% of millennials want to work for an organization which makes a positive impact. And 53 actually said they would work harder if they knew the company is making a difference to others. Um, Isabel, tell us a little bit more. Why did you start your NGO, Bye Bye Plastic Bags? Um, so six years ago in 2013, both my sister Malati, who couldn't be here today, and I started Bye Bye Plastic Bags, which, as she mentioned before, is a social initiative working on our, my home island, Bali, to get the people to say no to single-use plastic bags. And so the way that we do this is we do a lot of different forms of campaigning, whether that's through educational programs with schools or working and lobbying with the government, um, socialization programs, awareness, um, just lots of different approaches to getting our voices heard very much in the local community because in the end it is their island and you know after six years of hard working campaigning working with lots of different people on the island of Bali it actually resulted in I believe 10 days ago in a ban of plastic bags straws and styrofoam on Bali oh wow <laughs> what happens if you uh, do use plastic bags other um, utensils, or you just don't have supplies anymore. Of I'm not things. completely sure what the fine is. Um, I'd have to look into that, but it's it's definitely being more and more enforced um, throughout the island. Okay, great. We're definitely seeing results. Um, yeah, Fleming and uh, Ting Fan, what do you have to say about that? Do you think youth now are facing a future which is quite different to say 20, 30 years ago? Uh, in China, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, there is the phase of fast developing and everybody knows it. Although people sense a lot of problems, social problems, economic problems, people always think, oh, we are in a fast developing age, we, can get in, we are getting better and better, there's hopes in the future. So it seems that all problems are tolerable because on a whole we are getting in a fast developing stage. But nowadays, perhaps... the priority at the time was different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, a lot of uh, young people and uh, the even teenagers, they feel that uh, uh, the pace is getting slower <coughs> and uh, there are fewer and fewer chances these days to <laughs> getting to be successful. So there are these kinds of uh, stress on uh, the shoulder of the youth. And also nowadays as suggested, because of the age of internet, a lot of people are aware of those global issues and national issues. They are uh, more open-hearted than their uh, previous uh, adults. So nowadays I think uh, young people, they care really more of the whole society issues. Yeah, and I think you definitely raised an important point. I think the flow of information these days with the internet, mm -hmm. with social media, it's, it's definitely facilitating information exchange across different countries and continents. Fleming, what's your view? What, well, what do you think the next generation <clears throat> is facing? Well, I think, first of all, there's an ethical issue here, and I think every generation has a responsibility to give the globe back, at least in the same state as we received them from our parents. And I must admit, I'm really fearing that my generation may be the first generation where this could not happen. So we have a moral responsibility for the globe. And I think it's great that the youth is speaking up and expressing their voice. On the other hand, I'm a scientist, I'm a big optimist. 
And if I look at the world, as also Henry explained it today, I mean, I think the engineers and the natural sciences and so forth have created a better world today. We've seen the first, the second, the third, and the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And we are having a better world today. The GDP has been increasing. We have the fewest number of people living below $2 a day. It's still too many who are living below that, but I mean, we are in a better state today. And I actually still believe that we still have time to act. It is time to act now, but we still have time to act. And what do I mean with that? Well, I mean, if I look at the how, science... How, to what degree do you agree with that video, Greta's message? Well, I think the most important to me is time to act. What I do not like, I must admit, is her fear. Because I think it's very, very dangerous to express too much fear to young people here. Because that, I mean, you know, if I become fearful and do not use my brain any longer, then I cannot make the right decision. <coughs> And I think if I read the latest report from the scientists from UN channel panel, from the UN uh, climate panel reports, right, it is time to act, right? I mean, if we should keep the global temperature below 1.5 degree, and I think we showed elegantly here this morning that the consequence for not doing that is dramatic. Mm -hmm. We still have time here. I mean, it just means that, well, just, it means that within, I think, believe, before 2035, <coughs> we have to bring our net CO2 emission to zero and even we had to sort of capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Can we do this? Well, I mean, I still think that technology will help us solving some of these issues here. If you look at some of the other issues here, water scarcity, uh, converting into more sustainable energy production and so forth here, I still believe that investing in education, research and development, we will find ways to do it this year. Mm. There will be paradigm shift. Uh, I have been advocating strongly uh, for turning from a linear economy into a circular economy. In the linear economy, you are taking resources, you are produced, you are consumed, and create a lot of waste. And this cannot continue on, because if all people on the globe were living as we're doing in Denmark, that requires four global resources, and which is obvious, not sustainable. Mm -hmm. The overshoot day, meaning the day where we, seven billion people on the globe, is using more resources than the world can regenerate, is happening earlier and earlier. Last year, it was 1st of August. So it is time for acts. And in, in the circular economy, you have to keep resources in a closed cycle for longer. And I was drafting a report to the Danish government on circular economy where there are four R's, which is very important, and that is reduce, <coughs> reuse, recycle, and rethink. And again, I think, I mean, we can all reduce, and I think what you're doing, I greatly admire you, and congratulations for what you Thank have you been more. doing, because, I mean, plastic is one issue here. We should be much better in recycling and reusing plastic, but we should also be rethinking new ways of actually turning waste into a new resource. So I'm an optimist and I believe that we'll be able to do it, but it will require leadership, it will require responsive leadership, and you cannot run a business today without also having sustainability integrated in your business. Great, thank you. Um, reuse, recycle and rethinking. Yes. Using technology and think about the ways that we can make, uh, we can solve the problems, right? Be optimistic. Okay, well on that note about responsible leadership, uh, I'd like to move on to the second question. So responsible leadership is about making sustainable business decisions, which take into account the interests of all shareholders, and that would include shareholders, employees, clients, suppliers, community, the environment, and future generations. Unfortunately, some say our businesses and political leaders have been slow to recognize the need for change. And we see the frequent buzzwords such as corporate social responsibility, we see sustainability, but still, we're not seeing enough change and people are not happy about the current situation. So what are the business and policy innovations that can actually help to address the challenges? Um, actually, I, I think uh, yesterday we dis discussed that problem on the YGL uh, meeting as well. Uh, the difficulty is how to measure the social responsibility achievement. Uh, we discussed how to build a society um, in which uh, we just, um, uh, the success does not only mean the profit to shareholders, but also means the social responsibility <coughs> you pay to the whole society. But the difficulty is how to measure the second part. So now, although a lot of intellectuals, a lot of thinkers, a lot of even politicians recognize that how to make business uh, more 
responsible to, to the whole world. It's an important issue. Um, it's not that easy to implement <coughs> any policies or uh, just build any measurable uh, system onto it. But I think that a problem is very, very uh, important in, in the future because all the technologies has to be implemented by some companies, uh, groups, or government, or has to be implemented in now the economic system. So sometimes it is the uh, nowadays economic system and the mechanism that prevent these uh, advanced technology, these optimistic uh, technology to be implemented in all countries, in all parts of the world. Sometimes the price is too high and no subsidies. Sometimes it's not profitable to, to uh, to do this. Sometimes um, uh, they are just the free riders problems. We always discuss that in the economic issue. So without proper uh, policy schemes, uh, these are very diff technologies are not very easy to implement. And also there are those debates between different countries on whose responsibility is. So I think that there should be more um, subtle measurement of the social responsibility issue in on the national level as well as the global level. Great. Thank you, Jingfang. Um, Isabel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, in, in the process, as well. You started the company how many years ago? Six uh, years six ago. Six years ago. Mm -hmm. Have you been working with businesses and organizations um, to stop them from using plastic bags? How did you campaign? Yeah. So actually something that we launched, I think late last year was their program called Commitment, where we worked, I think, with 400 Bali-based businesses, um, where we gave them a sort of contract to sign where they could tick off the different single-use plastic items and by what date they were gonna rule them out of their business. And so I think we've worked a lot with the tourism industry as well because Bali is quite, you know, the touristic de uh, holiday destination. And so we've worked with them. Um, but what I see and what I want to sort of say um, is that I believe the responsibility um, to sort of be the agent for change in a sense, um, which, uh, wait, let me think about this, how I'm going to say this correctly. I think that change starts in the classroom, right? Before you have your first job, you go to school and you learn about things. And I think change starts within the classroom. If you know from a younger age, you know, this is how we have to look at a system, we can no longer have a linear business plan but more of a circular economy, then that's what you're gonna go out there in the world and implement, that's what you're, that's what you're gonna go out and do. And I think, you know, if you look at the education system, it hasn't changed for a very long time. But if you look at the world in the past 50 years alone or in the past 10 years, it's rapidly changing. And I, so, so I think there's definitely a bridge that, that needs to be made um, and a, a, definitely a shift in mindset in the education system. I think that's great. So change starts from the young children, start mm. from the classroom, from, start from the education. So when the kids grow up, they will be making better policy and business decisions. Yeah. What about the grown-ups? I fully agree that change starts in the classroom, but it also starts from the top and it starts for the business leaders because the tone from the top in a company is incredibly important. And again, I'm an optimist. If I look <coughs> at the world today and I talk to many chairmen, CEOs and so forth. I really see many companies today is actually adopting responsible and responsive leadership. And if I should speak on behalf of Carlsberg, the chairman here, I'm normally saying there's four P's which are important for Carlsberg. There's one P for profit. I mean, you cannot run a business today if you do not earn money. Otherwise, you may be out of business very soon. But there's three other P's which are equally important. And one of them is purpose. I mean, you said before that young people like would today great life to work in a company with a greater purpose. Um, we, as a company, have started back in 1847, very long history here at Chits, and our <laughs> purpose is brewing for a better world today and tomorrow. Mm. That has been very important, to inspire many people with inside the company, but I also see that engage with many of our consumers. So a purpose-driven company is very, very important, and I see more and more companies around the world is becoming purpose-driven. Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why would we like to create a better world? The next P is P for the planet. I mean, you can simply not run a business today without having sustainability deeply integrated in your roots. Business have to take responsibility for these climate issues we're seeing here today. And again, I'm pretty sure that if we ever is going to solve some of the 
UN 17 Sustainable Development Goal, it helps tremendously when you see these 17 Sustainable Development Goals being embedded in the strategy process of a company. And I've seen that more and more. And the final P is P for the for, uh, final P is P for people. I mean, we have been living in a century where B, maybe capital was the limiting factor. And now we're moving in a century where talent will be the limiting factor. Those organizations who have the right people with the right mindset, with the right entrepreneurial mindset, being agile and so forth, so they will be the leaders. And that also means that actually you have to actually engage with the user. And I think one very interesting aspect of this meeting here is again, acting, having the young people starting their own companies, the entrepreneurs, because that's very much needed going forward here. We have great technology which may help us solving some of the issues which should be scaled up, but we also very much needing new innovative technology to help solving some of our issues in our society. And again here, the use is actually those where we should actually put more effort into. And I must admit again, I'm admiring China here for all their great effort in innovation and entrepreneurship. And I would hope this would also happen in many other places around the world. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Fleming. Thank you, Isabel, and uh, thank you, Jing Fang. So we have, you know, we've got to start the chain from bottom <coughs> up, from education, from the classrooms, embedding the good values and ethics into your business mm -hmm. um, from inside out, have a good purpose, and recruit the right people. Again, that goes back to the classroom and education. So companies do need to boost and promote their ethics and values now more than ever. And this can't be achieved without responsible leadership. The best businesses are a force for good and they will make a positive impact on our society. So how are private sector leaders now rethinking their business models? I think that goes back to what you were saying early on, but do you think the, the businesses are doing enough to actually altering their business models, not just you know, from, the, from the top and thinking about your purpose and your your grand goal, but, but actually doing <coughs> something that makes concrete changes to your business model. Is that happening? Is that happening enough? Uh, okay, I introduced a little bit of my experience and, um, and some conclusion. Um, I'm doing some experimental in my own startup because we are trying to figure out a long run uh, model for doing these social uh, responsible <coughs> things. We uh, do the profitable uh, educational programs and sell that to the big city families. And we make the profit and we give the free educational programs to the kids in the mountain areas. We, we conduct that uh, uh, process in Sichuan, Guizhou, uh, Gansu, Shanxi, and Fujian provinces. So in, in the future, I tried to experiment more on this model to try to uh, sell our products to the families who can afford it and uh, use that profit to support our uh, programs in the poor provinces for the uh, young kids. Um, in order to do this, I, I think that in, in the future, um, more and more entrepreneurs who have the um, heart of responsibility to the society can try a different kind of uh, social enterprise models. And if it works, then this enterprise can run as a, um, <coughs> as a dam of the society to let the water from here to uh, get the water to flow to the other direction. And using that model, perhaps we can make the society a little bit better. So I think it should be creativity, innovation in, in every part of the society, not only tech technology, but also the business models, the new type of uh, uh, enterprises, and the new type of uh, uh, business networks, and all in every part of the society, there should be creativity and innovation. Only by innovation can responsible people really solve the uh, problems in society. Great, thank you, Jingfang. So using your profitable part of your business to support uh, the social responsibility side of, of your work. That's great. Anything to add, Fleming and uh, Isabel? Um, I want to say something just a little bit. I think slowly, surely, we are seeing, you know, businesses and corporations really take responsibility and making those small changes because they are seeing that, you know, being green and being sustainable can also be profitable. But having said that, I think because these 
often, you know, large industries, they have the capital backing behind them and they already have a huge platform. They can always do more. So that's, yeah, oh, just a little thought because, yeah, they can always do more. Yeah, they can always do more. Carlsberg Group. Well, I, I can only echo that everyone can always do more. Mm -hmm. for, for, but I, I must admit again, if I travel around the world, travel to Davos, travel to UN General Assembly and so forth, I've seen more and more companies stepping up and doing it. <coughs> Not only because doing good, but actually because it's actually doing great business. And actually, I think also we are moving from an area where well, there's only focus on short-term profit optimization to actually more long-term thinking. And doing this here because it's actually very good business. And again, I mean, you can simply not run a business today if you're not looking into the world and taking responsibility for the world because some of these issues here mm -hmm. are common issues here. And I see more and more business leaders actually doing it. But again, I must say that I'm actually very much optimistic in the way that I see more and more young people starting up being entrepreneurs. And of course, the big issue with starting a company is, of course, scale. I mean, you see many people starting a company and they are running it, but then, you know, when they then have to scale up, having the one first thousand employees, you know, I mean, that, that's always very difficult. And we should have more and more people doing this, actually helping, getting help, both capital, but also human resources to scale up these companies and scaling them up to the rest of the world here. I see a lot of great ideas starting up companies, solving some of the issues within the energy, within the environment, within the water and so forth here. But we should just help them to scale up and bring that technology out to the rest of the world. But in that respect, I'm actually still very, very optimistic we'll do it. Uh, it may also need some regulation, right? Uh, I think that um, in US and in China, uh, there are the resources to scaling up. I think in Europe, we are still lacking behind in sort of helping some of these startup companies, raising the capital, helping them scaling up. But maybe the new EU commission will help with doing that. Um, would any one of you name one or two very good business innovation or business models that you think actually helps to um, to address energy challenges? If any, have you seen any uh, good ones? Well, I mean, I'm normally saying there's a triangle which actually is very, very important. Uh, that is that you have to have bright people with bright ideas which may come out of university, file a patent. Then you have to have people who help formulating that into a business plan. And then you have to have investors helping them scaling that up. And I see that more and more places around the world. I think the California area and the Boston area has been very good in doing that. I was recently in Singapore. Again, they're very good in doing that. I think in China, actually, they are becoming better and better doing it. And of course, also Israel here. So this having bright people, people who can help them, because it's not always the uni university professors is very good at driving a business here. But they may be having an idea. We have to have business people bringing that from science into an idea and then from idea into a, a business here. I'm seeing it more and more, but it requires also from governments long-term investment in education, in innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to scale up? Or how difficult is it to scale up? Well, some are very successful in doing it and others are less successful. And uh, I think that if you have the people with the bright minds, with the business, people, business background, and then the people with the capital around, I mean, that, that, that certainly helps. Mm -hmm. And I, when I see startup companies failing in doing that, that's typically because they do not hire in people, 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 hiring people with the right competences, helping them, scaling it up. And then of course, I mean, some are very good in growing organically, other may need, you know, for the first many years to burn capital in order to scaling up. And that means also to have a long-term investor who trust in this idea helps also tremendously. Okay, so talent. We need a good business organization, a structure to mm. help scale up. We need investment into the right areas. Anything to add, Fong and uh, Isabel? Uh, I, I think that um, uh, it's always quite easy to uh, just uh, change in one company or uh, in the environment of the uh, private sector businesses. Uh, however, sometimes when you come across the issue of uh, uh, to changing the policy side or just uh, to have dialogues between different countries, then in, that might make uh, something really difficult. Um, for example, just like the environmental issue, uh, if 
uh, one company would like to do greener, uh, it's its own decision, that's easy. But sometimes if you would like the whole business environment to admit that this is an important issue that all communities should do together, or you think that uh, our country should do the efforts, but other countries should do the same, then it m might be very difficult. So some rational companies might be the free rider in this problem. N then it requires an, a collective effort on those issues. So sometimes we need to have the really r deep communication uh, mechanisms that can strengthen the trust that everybody do does the same. Um, then it can make those innovators really um, worth of it. Yeah, so I, I think that communication is m very important. Otherwise, we are in the prisoner's dilemma that uh, everybody knows if we cooperate together, we make the best result. But everybody thinks, oh, if I do the good person, but the others not, then I will get the worst result. Then on, the, uh, on that situation, nobody will do the good. So we need to really strengthen the trust that um, everybody has the consensus to move forward. And uh, all countries, the developed countries, developing countries are moving forward to make a better planet altogether. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. That's a great answer. I kind of just wanted to echo off of what she said, which was, you know, I think the key to scaling up is collaboration and partnerships. And I think the youth can play a really important role in that because we're hungry for knowledge, right? We want to learn everything we can. And so we can really be the bridge between the professors, the scientists, the government people, and really bring everyone together to work together in order to get those cool ideas, but also get the capital, the funding, get those people, the manpower to actually do it all in the same place so that we can really scale up and create that 100% change. But on another note, I think, you know, coming my background from NGOs and organizations, I think a huge tool for scaling up and sort of going global, we've noticed is social media, especially with the younger generation, right? Everybody has a phone, everybody is usually connected to the internet, and so you can literally share your message or what you want to do with one click of the button. You know, everything for our generation is, you know, at the tips of our fingertip, finger, <laughs> at the tips of our fingers, right? And so it's, I think social media is definitely a tool to, to use if you want to, you know, scale up. Um, when you're an organization or NGO to link up with others out there, like-minded people doing the same as you. Um, yeah. Great. Well, we talk about policy, we talk about policy decisions, we talk about within a company you need to have the right innovators, we need to have the right uh, business leaders at the top who give them the, the support to support the innovate innovations that, that they're going to bring out. Um, we talk about collaboration between the different parties within your own country and also globally. Then Isabel just mentioned social media is a great tool to spread the message worldwide. What is the next step plan for your bye-bye plastic bags? Are you moving on to bye-bye something else? Um, not yet, but actually bye-bye plastic bags has grown from being you know, a small NGO on Bali to I think today having over 40 locations globally, all wow. led by young people, all working to get either their cities, countries, um, or towns plastic bag free as well, which is really inspiring for us to see that, you know, it's grown into this movement not only to say no to plastic bags, but also a message of youth empowerment, right? We're the living example that kids can do things. Kids can do things. How, how do the people in Bali, how did the, the tourists, how do they feel about the no plastic bags? Are, are they generally okay with, with, with that? They're living up? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's just a matter of changing, changing the norms, right? Mm -hmm. Creating the new norm to bring an alternative bag or a lot of shops in Bali, you know, boutiques and retail spaces have made that investment to provide alternatives to their customers. And so they will have reusable bags that you can use ready at their store once you make a purchase. And so I think, you know, a lot of the tourists, they're pretty okay. Okay. Um, you know, when they see, oh, no plastic bags, a lot of them are very happy, as well as the local people. You know, as soon as you educate the person on the problem, which, you know, in Indonesia, people often say, oh, the Indonesians, the locals, they don't care. You know, they're just throwing plastic left and right. But 
after having many conversations with them, we realized they just didn't know that there was an issue, right? They thought, oh, the plastic looked ugly in the environment, that's it. But once you told them, okay, these are the negative effects it was having, they were like, oh, okay, how can I become a part of the solution? What can I do in my daily life to change? And so everybody was pretty open to, to the change um, in law and regulation. And so everybody, um, we've had pretty positive results, I think, so far. That's great. Um, oh, something to add? Yeah, I'm quite impressed by uh, her expression that uh, kids can really do things. Actually, we used to live in a world that is too slowly developed. So every generation uh, used to follow the direction of the last generation and follow to a ladder maybe in his 40s or 50s and do some innovative things and try to um, try to make changes from the top. So then you, you have to uh, uh, just uh, climb up the social ladder to the top and then make some changes. But I think that uh, in the, for the next one or two generations, the world is changing so fast that every three years, five years, there's another world. And the adults, the old people just uh, left the, they are just out of date. <laughs> so sometimes I, I think that you, the young generation, the new kids, they can change their world. They can create their world. They do not need to follow the path all through their life for 40 or 5, 50 years. They can make a better world for themselves. I, so I, I do have hope in the next generation, the young people, and I do uh, hope that they can think big. They can <coughs> just uh, think of those big questions and then c they can think of those new solutions to the world's problem. Yeah, and I, now I do the educational programs to young kids. So I encourage the kids to think big questions, to think big, think deep. And from the beginning, they can think that they can make a change. And I, I think that makes the new world. Great. And if I could just add one more thing to the what's next. Yes. Um, I forgot to mention this. We've been keeping it under wraps for a couple of years, but it's been in the developmental process. And naturally, you know, through Buy My Plastic Bags, as I said, we've really embodied the message of youth empowerment. And so naturally, our next project, which we're hoping to launch in the next two months, is called Youthtopia where we aim to create spaces and platforms and a sort of headquarter for young people to come together. Because through our campaigning, we've had so many reach outs from young people saying, hey, you know, I'm really passionate about this, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make a difference. I don't know how to become a change maker. And so hopefully, Youthtopia can be that one-stop destination or one stop for young people to go when they want to create a change in their lives and in their communities. And so it's really inspired with sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning where we connect those uh, people who want to be activists and change makers with those already on the front lines of change to mentor each other um, in a sort of process of really connecting and becoming together. And we really want to create a physical space because as we've you know, noticed today at this meeting and you know, at these forums is that creating those networking and those connections between people is so important. You know? And so hopefully with Utopia, that's what we can achieve. Fantastic, Utopia. Well, well, collaboration. Well, I think we should uh, <laughs> we should clap at that. I think, Thank uh, you. You know, I'm I'm very impressed by what Bye Bye Plastic Bags and what Isabel and your sister have achieved, and uh, now your new platform, giving young people the opportunity and giving them the platform to to come together and drive for change. I love the energy in you. Fantastic. Okay. Well, we. Could we save that to the concluding remarks? Because we, we need to now move on to q and I'm sorry, Fleming. Um, OK, so now we come to our Q&A session. Right, we're going to keep this very dynamic. So we're going to have Jesse over there, who's a comedian, um, a very well-known internet personality and comedian, who is going to be helping out with the questions in the audience. And can I just say, one person, one question at a time, and please, Keep your question short and concise. Also, we have something of a challenge for the panelists. So for each question, we will have these parameters that our panelists have to, um, when you answer the question, you have to answer within. Uh, for example, we'll have, you know, answer the question in less than 10 words. So that would be a challenge. And when, when you uh, ask the question, Jesse will have a bowl, and there will be strips of paper in there. So pick one and 
have your question and then they will answer the question with that challenge which is in the bowl. Is that clear? Okay, great. All right. So, I, we have question number one. Any who, questions? Who's got the first question for us? <coughs> oh, come on. Hopefully somebody we have over here. All right. First question, please. Uh, what's your question? Uh, my question is to all of you, but probably mainly to Isabel. Um, are you kind of sad that so much responsibility is placed on the youth to force change in the world? Would you rather the governments just take decisions that might be politically uh, you know, not so popular? Or do you think actually changing social norms and pressures is the way forward and the only way to change the world in the long term, even if it takes a little bit longer to do? Very good. And then what is the challenge for the answer? The challenge is? Answer the question in less than 10 words. Oh, there we go. <laughs> wow. So who's responsible, the youth or the grown-ups? Are we out of date? <laughs> right? And that, that's sort of the question, right? In 10 words. Okay. It's, uh, I think it's a bit of a balance, right? It's working from the top down and the bottom Oops, up. That's more than 10 <laughs> Sorry. You know, please go ahead, Isabel. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's sort of what I wanted to say is it definitely has to be a combination of working together. Yeah. Anything, anything to add? It's either or. We're all responsible. Mm. We're all responsible. To me, changes should be made from now. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, we don't have time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, love it. <laughs> there we go. Good job. Very good. Awesome. Uh, where's our next question coming from? I can run around the room. <coughs> Over here, back. yep, in the back. I got you right here. Oop, we're losing a strip. Ah, we lost it for good. There we go. Over here, uh, what's the question first? So the question is, one thing that's very impressive about this panel is how diverse it is and how inclusive it is. Uh, different ages, different backgrounds from different parts of the world. So firstly, I really commend you all on that. But how tightly aligned are these issues? Having diversity in our boardrooms and throughout our companies and throughout you know, those uh, decision-making points in society and inclusivity as well. And how do we solve these issues together? All right, questions about diversity and the challenge is? Oh, no glasses. Oh, no glasses. <laughs> Answer the question in a way that a five-year-old could understand it. like to have a go at that. Oh. I think Fleming. The diversity is very much embedded into my heart and of course gender diversity is one aspect of this here and uh, gender diversity is as big problems as many other things and again tone from the top is incredibly important here. Diversity in the boardroom, diversity in the management team and also among the young people here. Um, that's very very important to me. Incredibly important. We all equal. Great. Uh, since I have a five-year-old daughter, so I'll try to answer this question like just like I, I talked to my daughter. Fantastic, please. So uh, there are diversities just as there are different kids in a class. So y you have boys, girls, uh, you have uh, classmates of all the uh, characters. So if everybody only ask for things for himself or herself, then uh, there will be argues and uh, conflicts every day between the kids. So you have to think and talk to each other and think that uh, as a class, what should you do? Uh, you are a group together, so can you talk to each other and uh, share your opinions? Can you exchange your uh, things and you do things t uh, one by one by turns. So e as you are a class and a whole, you should have a sense of the whole and then all the diversities can be solved uh, since you are a class together. I think that's a really good answer. I mean, yeah. it can all comes down to a, to a classroom, right? Yeah. Great, Over thank you, uh, Ding Fong, for that. Over here, got another question up in the front. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is with regards to having diversity and inclusivity in the boardroom. We just uh, we have a very diverse panel in terms of age, and we just heard Greta Thun, uh, Thunberg as well. 
So what are your views on that? Because in order to sort of promote responsible leadership and have the right kind of engagement from all the stakeholders, do you think that companies and organizations are ready to have that kind of diversity in the boardroom? All right, so the question is boardroom diversity and the challenge is uh, work together amongst the three of you to come to a consensus on the answer. Let's see if you agree. <laughs> Fleming, can I ask you, how many, how so diverse I, I, is your board? Very diverse. So tone from the top is again incredibly important. When I became chairman, there was only men in the boardroom. And then I set a quota on 40% of the board members should come from the underrepresented gender. And that's still females in Carlsberg. And now we are 30%. And there's fantastic female board members out there. So as long as the chairman says that we have to have a more diverse board, go out and find them, and they are there. Tone from the top is just important, and we can do it. Great, that's, that's just on the side. So, consensus. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty good. Um, it leaves a lot of people out experience with, yeah. or do you? How do you deal with the diversity thing? Well, I kind of want to ask a question out to the audience right now. Who in this room is under the age of 20? No one. one. Me. One. Me. <laughs> Um, and so I definitely, you know, I'm very honored that the World Economic Forum um, reached out to me and allowed me to be a part of this. But I think, you know, a huge part of diversity is giving a seat at the table to everyone's voices, you know. And I particu particularly am an advocate for youth voices, right? Because often in m meetings where decisions are being made about our future, we are not included, right? And it's not only on those important days that we need to be there, but the entire process as well. We need to be a part of, you know, regulation making, always sort of, as you said, like all the stakeholders have to be considered. You know, whether, it doesn't matter what background you are, what age, what race, gender, everyone, it's everyone's world, so everybody should, you know, have an equal right to be a part of it, I think. That's a great answer. And anything to add? I may add here that I'm actually also chairman of an organization called Unleash, and Unleash brings every year together 1,000 talents aged 20 to 30 years old, trying to come up with solutions to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Gender diversity 50-50, male, female, 128 different countries involved here, solving some of the issues within food, health, energy, education, ICT, urban sustainability. We will actually go to Shenzhen here in November this year here, trying to unleash the potential. As, as you were saying, what we're trying really to educate them to be the next leaders here, trying to be innovative here, come up with new solutions here. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly important to engage with the youth here. And if any of you would like to hear more about Unleash, then unleash.org and otherwise contact me. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Although it wasn't quite a, a collective answer. Mm -hmm. Whoops. Different voices. Very good, do we have uh, one more question? <coughs> any more questions from back here maybe? We have one back here. Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, your opinion on how we can incorporate this kind of teaching in the educational system, and whether it's uh, policy, whether it's um, tools or curriculum, uh, starting at what age? All right, questions uh, how to incorporate into the educational system, and the challenge is? How would your child or parent answer this question? <laughs> Okay, since perhaps uh, I'm the only person that uh, can uh, answer to this challenge. <laughs> um, as educational program, if my daughter, she will say that I am a grown up already, don't call me a baby. I'm already five years old. <laughs> I can decide things for myself and I know a lot about the world. My daughter uh, said that um, I, I like the knowledge. I like to know about the world. I would like to be some of some, some, some. She, she, she had uh, tens of dreams <laughs> and changes every day. But I think she will answer to this question is that um, I'm curious of this world. I would like to know everything about this world, and I am already uh, old enough to know things about this world. And I like Earth. 
I like the universe. I like to go to the other planets uh, in my life. So I think that kids, uh, then as an adult, I think that all the kids, they naturally have the sense of being a citizen on the earth, on this planet. Uh, and she um, just doesn't have the boundary, the sense of uh, uh, the other country, the, the, the differences uh, of me and other countries' kids, and she just don't have the sense of conflicts of all those nations. So she naturally thinks that as a <coughs> citizen on this planet, we should protect the Earth. I just hope that the sense for of the kids can be a sense for adults as well to take the planet as a whole and to just ignore the minor diversities uh, among us and to see us as human, as uh, homo sapiens on this planet. We are actually a whole. Uh, we have to have this sense of a planet to actually protect our planet. Thank you, Jingfang and Fleming. You had something to add? And again, I mean, the educational system has also changed rapidly because the half of the people entering the education system today will get a job which does not exist yet. Yeah. And therefore, besides having the literacy's ability to read and write and mathematics and coding a computer and so forth, uh, other soft skills like ability to <coughs> be creative, being ability to collaborate, being able to communicate and so forth, are even more important today than ever. So actually, I also believe that actually universities are filled with bright people, but also very conservative people. Mm -hmm. So we should really also have to rethink how we are educating the next generation of people with more focus again on, in my opinion, creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, ability to collaborate, partnerships and so forth. Mm -hmm. Isabel, do you think there is enough curricular in schools currently? Well, my mom's in the room, so I'm going to try to answer this short and to the point <laughs> as she would. Um, but y yes and no. I think um, you definitely start as young as possible, and I think change has to come from within the curriculum. I think we have to move away from this sort of idea that one size fits all with education, because not every kid is the same. Not every kid is going to learn the best the same way. Right? And so I think you know, that also includes standardized testing in a sense. I've, I'm going to start senior year, and I've never sat in an exam because I go to a very different alternative school that focuses on project-based learning, which I think is the way to go. Because That's when you're out there in the world, right, kind of you're, that? Um, it's called the Green School. It's an international school. It's very amazing. Um, but the thing is, when you're out there in the world, you're not going to be handed a test, right? Maybe like a metaphorical test, but that's also a project, right? And you're going to have to learn how to create those problems, uh, how to create those collaborations, how to do problem solving, how to have those skills to move forward um, that you would learn not from a textbook, but from experience and from bringing those, you know, real world situations and issues and problems into the classroom. And so I think that the curriculum has to change to make it very relevant to, did it, to today's world. Actually, Great. that's what we do in China. We bring those project-based learning into China. We give the children projects to do, and we also teach them uh, history from the planet's view. We teach both the Western history and Chinese history and mingle them together, science and arts together, and let the children to do projects related <coughs> to everyday life. So we think that the reforms uh, within the school system has to be changed, but sometimes we can make it faster. And that's actually why I talk about flex security, a flexible education system. In Denmark, we have what it calls uh, a very flexible labor market, but we should actually also have the ed educational market. And I fully echo what is being said here about sort of the project-based learning here. Great. Project-based learning. We're seeing great results, Isabel. Have you always been so eloquent? Uh, no, <laughs> um, no, I'm a little rusty. Bye bye plastic bags has um, helped you. Um, I always like to think of bye bye plastic bags sort of as a life school because I think I've learned many different skills that you know maybe a standard school wouldn't be able to teach, like public speaking. I remember six years ago when we started, I was shaking. I had my script written word for word on A4 paper, and I, I even had crutches on stage. I don't know why. That? And I was freaking out, but I think, you know, through practice and experience, you get better at these sort of things. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, bioplastic bags has definitely shaped, helped shape me into the person I am today. Great. Well, I think we are running out of time, so that'll be the end of our Q&A session.
Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you some figures before we end today's uh, session. According to the Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change, we're less than 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. In that time, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society need to have taken place, including a reduction by green gas emissions by at least 50%. So again, we come back to responsible leadership. Leaders today need to think about <coughs> how to deal with challenges, the problems that we're facing now in order to pave a way for the success of the next generations. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you for a concluding remark on today's session. Something that's tweetable, something that you can put on social media, say on Weibo or something else. Not too long. Embed the four P in profit, people, planet, and purpose in your business. Great, the four Ps. Profit, purpose, planet, and people. Two ladies. Us kids may only be 25% of the world's population, but we are 100% of the future. Great. <laughs> if um, developing countries and developed countries are only blame the other, to be responsible to the planet, then the problem will never be solved. We will drop into the prison dilemma, prisoner's dilemma. Uh, everybody should think himself or herself as a human on this planet. We should have the sense of the whole to protect our planet. Great, thank you, Jing Fang. So we think about diversity, we think about building purpose, building people into your business plan. We think about collaboration, not just within your own country, but also globally. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's a great session. Thank you, our panelists, for sharing with thank us. You. And we also thank Henry and Adriana for your presentations and Jesse for helping out <coughs> with the uh, wonderful Q&A session. And thank you for being with us today. <laughs>